as a research scientist, you always try to find the why and the how. And the problem with the modern medicine is not the why and the how. Here's your disease. Here's your symptom. Here's a pill. Believe it or not, I personally believe about 85% of all cancers and all diseases are preventable without the use of toxic chemicals. Welcome to the Be Better broadcast. Today, we are joined by Dr. Lale Talebian. And for those who don't know Dr. Lale, she is a PhD and is a cancer research scientist, a nutrition specialist, a podcaster, Amazon bestselling author, and a professional bodybuilder. As a research scientist with more than two decades of experience, Dr. Lale earned her PhD in molecular biology of cancer from Dartmouth College. Her research has been published in 10 major peer-reviewed scientific journals. She has guided her patients to lose over 100 pounds, go from unsolvable chronic pain to living pain-free, and to go from death's doorstep to thriving under her care. This is a powerful conversation when it comes to healing your body, using food to heal your body, and just feeling better overall using the power of food mindset and everything else we're going to talk about today with Dr. Lale. Be sure to have a notebook ready because we're going to dive into some pretty complex things, I'm sure, as you can probably tell from that introduction. And if you take even just one thing away from this conversation with Dr. Lale, all that we ask is you share this conversation with just one other person who could use it as well. You are the reason the Be Better broadcast has grown to over 300 episodes, over 100,000 downloads over the last few years, because you are the best part of the Be Better team. Without further ado, we are joined by Dr. Lale all the way from Vermont. Dr. Lale, it's great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. So I'd like to ask you with that, all the experience that you have in this realm of nutrition and overall longevity and health and feeling great, how did your journey go from you being a cancer research scientist to then progressing to be a nutrition specialist? Yeah, great question. My journey to cancer research began actually back when I was 15. Um, my dad died of cancer on my 15th birthday. And I knew before that I wanted to become a scientist to cure disease, but that day cancer became my obsession. And uh, I had to, you know, flee the political upheavals in Iran and the war, two countries, and 20 years later, I got my PhD in cancer biology. Although one thing that always bothered me was that last image that I had in, from my dad was on his deathbed, barely 100 pounds, and withering away to the chemotherapy more than anything else. And throughout my research, I struggled with this because we wait till people get sick and we try to fix it. And in my research and clinical trials, which was also cancer, I... Um, kept seeing this coming back. People are sick, then we try to treat them, and then there's side effects of the treatment. And But why do we have to wait till people get sick? And I started becoming more interested in prevention. Mm -hmm. And um, through a lot of research, I'm a researcher, I'm a nerd <laughs> by <laughs> nature. So I, I have always been interested in uh, health and wellness and exercise and nutrition. But um, I did more and more research of my own and really, really became interested in how we can prevent the body from getting disease. And believe it or not, I personally believe about 85% of all cancers and all diseases are preventable without the use of toxic chemicals and um, with just how you treat your body and what you eat. And um, so I shifted my mindset. I started doing this part-time and eventually I broke free from academia because there's a lot of limitations to what you can do, <laughs> especially when you try to say no drugs mm. and uh, no chemotherapy, no hospitalization, and uh, kind of uh, went full time into this uh, back in 2008. Uh, but I've been doing this um, nutritional healing and lifestyle coaching since 2010, um, part time and then full time since 2018. Wow, that's incredible. It's it's amazing how you've made it your life's mission in order to help people who were in the same boat as your father, but also to help people so that they don't get into that boat in the first right. Place, mm -hmm. Right. 
So there's a lot of people who unfortunately have cancer in their family and they know mm-hmm. someone to them who have cancer and they might even have lost someone to that. Mm-hmm. But most of them, 99.9% don't make it their life's mission in order to help to create and help people to, I don't want to say create a cure, but essentially there have been many people with cancer who have been quote unquote cured from cancer using mm-hmm. very similar practices. And if not the same practices as we're going to talk about today. So I'm excited to talk about that, but many don't go on to make it their life's mission in order to help other people. Mm-hmm. Have you always been this, as you put it, have you always been a, a, a nerd, a researcher when it comes to these different areas? Like, how did that begin? Uh, yeah, I have always uh, had an interest, like I said, in health. And, you know, my first uh, experience with coaching actually began when I was about gee, maybe 13. And we used to have a pool and I loved to be in the pool and swim. And I, I used to be afraid of the water, by the way, a lot when I was a kid. And my dad literally was the person who get, got me over that fear and then I be- fell in love with swimming. And we had a neighbor's kids who was, you know, eight, seven or eight years old, and she was petrified. And so I started coaching her to swim. And as a 13-year-old, I started the neighborhood business uh, at the time and started coaching all the kids, about you know five to seven-year-old during the summer to teach them swimming. And it was great babysitting for the parents too, because they had them off for like four or five hours you know, middle of the day. So that was the first time I realized how much I actually loved to coach and teach in general. And um, then I started as a, I don't know, maybe 16 year old, 15, 16, I started uh, making diet plans for my my uh, sisters, uh, my older sisters, like friends and my cousins and people who wanted to get healthy. Everyone wanted to lose weight and all that. So I had this diet plan that I created and I I don't really know how I came across and how I came up with it, but it worked. Yeah. So it was like, that was my first, you know, without even thinking about it, I got into it, if you will. That's and- <laughs> very interesting. Like, were yeah. you someone who, did you have to learn how to create, like, what even inspired you to dive into the world of nutrition or were you always inspired by that that field? Well, you know, as, as a research scientist, you always try to find the why and the how. And the problem with the modern medicine is not the why and the how. Here's your disease. Here's your symptom. Here's a pill. Yeah. And so where... Where did that come from? How how did that happen? That's the number one thing, because a lot of things actually are environmental, even when it comes to cancer. Um, So, but we have to eat, right? (laughs) We do have to eat no matter what. We don't have to take medications. We don't have to take supplements. We don't have to do any of that, but we always have to eat. And that's what we need. And I always used to use, I'm a car junkie, so I will use my car example. You can have a Lamborghini. But if you put sand in it, it won't go far, right? Yeah. So you can have, you can exercise and do all kinds of stuff. And I'm an exercise addict and proud of it, believe me. But 15% is exercise. 85% is the fuel you put in your body. Whoa. So, and you know, I hate to say it, but <laughs> I wish it was the other way around, but it isn't. <laughs> so you have this body and you only have this one and only body. You can't rent one. You can't borrow one. You can't buy another one. Now, let me ask you this. If I told you, can you put sand in your car once a month just for fun? You'd think I'm crazy, right? But when it comes to putting junk in our bodies, people don't ever think about that, right? So that's my my approach. If there's something doesn't belong in your body, it's going to wreck your body. Just like that sand is going to wreck the engine of the car. It's not going to let it run. The thing is, our bodies are so efficient and the design is just fabulous. It's so smart that we get to kind of deal with that problem longer than a car would. Yeah. So imagine if you put diesel in a gas car or vice versa, right? What would happen? Blows right? up. It blows up. It doesn't work. So it's like we are putting, uh, you know, wrong fuel in our bodies all the time. So, but the only thing is that our bodies are so well designed. And they have so many mechanisms to kind of try to fight this, try to fight this, and then eventually catches up with us. And that's the issue. The fuel that goes into the body is absolutely the most important thing. Things you eat affect every aspect of your body's function at a cellular level, at a molecular level, and at a mental level everywhere. (laughs) And have you, have you encountered individuals, maybe even those you've coached 
who have cancer or had cancer and were able to eliminate cancer from their bodies by using the power of food? Have you, have you witnessed that? Yes, I have worked with, I've been blessed with working with many cancer patients who have beat the odds. Um, many of them are knock on wood, still living a healthy life. Um, but the most powerful story, can I share a story? Oh, absolutely. Please. Um, I, um, was referred, uh, this woman was referred to me, um, with a three month death sentence. She was given three months to live. And, um, at that point she, um, had decided that she was just gonna not do any chemo or any, any treatment, but she was going to go into the alternative, uh, form of therapy. And someone referred her to me who had had the same experience and was, uh, given three months, actually, he was given less than three months, but he lived 11 years after that. So I can mention her name because she was very open about it. So Gail came to me and we started working together. And uh, in about six months, now I'm saying six months because she had three months, right? Do the math. She went back to her oncologist and they had tests. And um, she uh, had to been told that she only had a one option, and that was to do participate in a phase one clinical trial. For those of you who don't know what phase one clinical trial is, it's not going to help you. It's just going to help others coming after you. Basically, you're kind of like a guinea pig. And uh, so she and her oncologist said, and I quote, unfortunately, there is no cancer in your body, so you don't qualify for this phase one clinical trial, end quote. Needless to say, I apologize on her behalf <laughs> to Whoa. Gail. And that was a mindset that you don't have cancer. We can't put you on this trial. Not, oh my gosh, you're cancer free. Good yes. news, right? That wasn't the thing that she heard. And she was like, how am I supposed to take this? I said, you're not supposed to. Forget it. Um, so Gail lived seven and a half years after that three month death sentence. Oh my God. And she lived a full life. For seven and a half years. She participated in bike rides to raise funds for cancer research. She walked, she had her home through group. One fundraiser we have here, she had upwards of 50 people in her team to raise funds for, you know, cancer and people and all of that. So um, unfortunately, Gay passed away a few months ago due to an complications from infection. Mm, and, totally uh, related. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, unrelated, but it totally made her weak. And, you know, then she couldn't yes. eat. So, but that's a powerful story I like to share because she said when I was given, in her words, she said, when I was given three months to live, Lolly gave me my life back. Wow. I didn't give her life back. I gave her a blueprint. I gave her a map. I was her GPS. I gave her the tools. She took charge of her own health. And she believed in it and she did it. And she wasn't going to give in to that three-month death sentence somebody arbitrarily gave her. And so she lived a full, happy life seven years after that. That's beautiful. Right. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine stories like that inspire you to even go more into hyperdrive to get this Absolutely. out to your people. Absolutely. Yeah. And there are many, many, many good stories. I have people uh, that are still I'm in touch with years after, you know, their cancer treatments were finished and they, we worked together and they were still in touch. That's one of the things that I, I stay in touch with almost every single every single person that walks into my life because <laughs> they give they give meaning to my life. Yes. So I'd like to break this conversation into several sections of one maybe for the person who's in Gail's situation who currently is diagnosed with cancer, but also for the person who might know they have cancer in their family or some other disease in mm -hmm. their family, or they just want to prevent as much as possible any disease of entering their life. And like what you talk about with the preventative measures mm -hmm. that, we, that I like to cover. So what, and you mentioned a blueprint when Gail came to you saying, Lale, I've got three months. Like mm -hmm. you must, I mean, you, you, you know your stuff. So maybe you knew, okay, we need to start here, but three months isn't a lot of time, mm -hmm. right? Like some mm -hmm. onboarding processes are three months. Yep. So where do you begin with someone who is, is experiencing cancer? Like what, what does that blueprint look like? First, let me start with saying this. No one, nobody in this world has the right to give someone an expiration date. 
So to any person out there who was told you have so many number of months or years or whatever, you have to forget that because nobody knows. No one knows. I have three examples. One person who lived 35 years after that death sentence, one person who lived 11 years after that, and I just told you about Gail, seven and a half years after that. So number one thing is no one knows, no one has the right to do that. And I really, it bothers me that there are people out there, physicians, oncologists that feel like they can give, they have the right to tell a person that nobody knows. So number one, uh, but how do I approach a person with a diagnosis of cancer or anything for that matter? I started as a cancer researcher, but then I was called in with all kinds of different things. People would come to me for um, different things. Can you help me? And of course, I'm a problem solver. So yes, I can. But first thing that I do is um, I start a person with a comprehensive questionnaire. And I, I'm blessed with a background in genetics and molecular biology and immunology. So I look at a person's everything that's unique about them because every single person is unique and they should be treated that way. So there is not a one size fits all. So first thing is, especially when it comes to cancer, there are some genetic predispositions and there are some mutations that people have. So really it comes so down to what type of mutation that person has that caused the cancer. And I look at that and how can we keep this cancer at bay, keep it from growing, not feed it, but starve it. Mm -hmm. But depending on a person's genetics, that makes a difference on what things I may um, recommend to one person and not to the other person. So even when it comes to the same type of cancer, um, this is kind of important. I, I may have two women, both 55 years old, both were diagnosed with breast cancer, both are about the same height and weight and similar pro, you know, demographics. But depending on some of the genetic mutations that predispose them to that and some of the lifestyle around them, I may recommend one with something food that I may not recommend to another one. And yes. it comes down to that, that level of uniqueness, because even with two people with the same type, same breast cancer, still their genetics are different. So it's that level of precision and individuality, because that's how, you know, people are unique. And uh, so I look at all of that and I, design a comprehensive nutrition plan based on that person's unique attributes and genetics and background and even family history. Not only that, but their likes and dislikes, because that's important, right? Because when you eat, if you don't enjoy food, you're not going to do it for long term, right? So yeah. I make sure that I always say the first thing, if you don't like something, I may recommend a different recipe, but if you still don't like it, we won't talk about it because food has to be enjoyed. There's plenty of it out there, so we can work with that. So that's kind of, and I always guarantee that no two individuals um, have the same meal plan. No two plans are the same. Wow. So my method is very inefficient because I don't have an app. I don't have an admin. I don't have somebody I've trained to do this. It's all in here. Yeah. And it all comes with me having a relationship with that person which normally it's a long-term lifetime relationship. And I need to do that. So I'm inefficient, but you get me and you don't get someone else when you work with me. It's strictly on that level. That's, that's how we work. Wow. That's beautiful. When you're creating these plans for people and you're giving them this custom nutritional game mm -hmm. plan, which by the way, for people who have cancer or without, this is huge, right? Because right, yeah. I know so many people who are always asking, I need to go to a nutritionist to get a nutrition game plan. And now I right. know one personally who can help them, which is great. So is it more so adding in specific foods mm -hmm. or is it more so eliminating a lot of someone is the uh, foods that someone is already eating or consuming? Is it more so adding or eliminating? So it's a little bit of both. Um, so number one thing, so that seven day blueprints that I told you about yeah. is actually, it's actually detoxing your home and environment and your life. 
Okay. Because that's the number one thing we want to get rid of. If there are things around you that you either eat or exposed to, you need to get rid of them. Toxins. Can you give us some examples of what some of those might look like? Oh, yeah, I can give you an example. Like in every household's medicine cabinet, um, there are a lot of things, whether it be supplements or your usual Advil, <laughs> you know, or painkiller or whatever, or your prescription medications. And how many of you have things in your medicine cabinet that have all kinds of bright colors? Right. And those colors are basically branding for that company. So when you think of Advil, what color do you think about? If it's a gel, it's really bright, bright green. If it's a cap, it's like that brownish red color, right? That dye in those pills is a known carcinogen. Wow. In medicine. So in medicine. So you are getting, you're taking Advil or your prescription medication or, your, or a supplement and they have dyes in them. And the dyes strictly serve the purpose of branding wow. because I fought this. I have fought this for many years. I go and look for a Advil or ibuprofen that doesn't have dye in it. And I recommend that for my clients if they have to take it. I don't recommend it. But can you it, find that? Is that even something? Yes, you can. Get? You can have all kinds of your stuff. You have to know this in order to ask it and look for it. So I've done a lot of research, of course, and I have found all these different things that people and people ask me often. So how about like, what am I, what am I going to do if I have a headache or whatever? Yes, you can. So that's just one example in your household. But there's also a lot with food, which I'm not going to get into because it's pretty big. <laughs> but yeah, that's just a simple example. Yeah. Amazing. Is mm -hmm. there a specific food or a specific ingredients or, or the makeup or something of food that most people consume that by eliminating this will make mm -hmm. a giant difference in their life from what you found? Yes, yes, yes. And probably 90% of people out there will disagree with me, but I am very, very different and, and controversial here. Uh, grains. All grains, gluten Bread. or non-gluten, your oatmeal, your hot cereal, your cold cereal, your bread, and anything that has a grain, and I'm not talking about gluten, gluten-free products are even more toxic. Whoa. Yes. So I don't recommend grains at all. Grains were never part of our evolutionary diet. Humans, cows, fish, chicken, turkey, None of us were supposed to have grains ever in our diet. So, and the gluten-free is just a fad. And I don't believe in diets. I believe in the way mother nature intended for us to eat. And if we do that, we don't need to diet and we don't need, we most likely won't get sick as often. Right? How powerful is that? Yeah. Now think about this. If you go in nature and put a steak in front of a cow, right? <laughs> it wouldn't eat it, right? Unless you force it, the cow doesn't even have the digestive system and the tools to use utilize that. So they won't. If you um, made a wild cat vegan, it wouldn't survive. I guarantee it. They won't survive. They eat what they're supposed to naturally eat. So who is it in this our nature, <laughs> our natural world that needs a dietitian or don't eat what they were supposed to eat? We're humans. And our domesticated animals. Other than that, you don't ever have to. Do you ever see an overweight deer, no. <laughs> right? No. Or an anorexic elephant? You don't, <laughs> right? They eat what they're supposed to eat. And those diseases that we get really don't exist in nature. How many types of cancer do deer get or wild cats get? No, they don't. So there is a lot to be learned about nature. And that's basically my basic philosophy that our diet didn't ever consist grains. And it's a whole course I teach about that. I call them a good and the bad and the ugly with all the food groups. Uh, you know, it's called the proteins and the carbohydrates and the fat, the good and the bad and the ugly in each group. So uh, what benefits can someone expect to see and how quickly by eliminating grains and by the way, stupid question, pasta is considered a grain, correct? Well, not all pasta nowadays are grain made with grains, but generally traditional pasta, yes, it is made with wheat most, most likely. 
What types of pasta are not made from grain? Like Oh, there are pastas pasta these or- days. Oh, oh, gosh, I have a whole list of them. There are pastas that are made with lentils. There are pastas that are made with chickpeas or wow. hearts of palm. Oh, you can eat all of those without grains. Life without grains is very possible and is very enjoyable. I have not had a piece of grain in about, I don't know, 12 years. Wow. <laughs> yep. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's very, very manageable. So the good news is, when I started this, there wasn't very many options. I had to make recipes for everything, even mm-hmm. making your own bread and making your own. Nowadays, 10 years later, there's a lot more options out there. So that's the good news. <laughs> and you're but a that's busy a good question. person too. What was yeah, that? You're, you're always on the go. You're a busy person. Like yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm assuming you travel at times. Like is, how feasible is it to, like how often are you mostly cooking for yourself Mm-hmm. Or are you going to restaurants very often? Because I know there's some great restaurants in Vermont, great food mm-hmm. up there. Like, mm-hmm. how, what does that mix look like? And how do you manage that with a busy lifestyle? You know, I'm so glad you asked this because people think it's impossible. I say anywhere I go out, I travel. Uh, not uh, not as much as, you know, you might think. Um, I used to travel more, not anymore, but I do still go away. And in fact, I we just celebrated our 10th anniversary with my partner. We, we went out and he eats the same way I eat. And Yes, you can. The only thing that you need to understand is you need to learn to know what to choose. And before you go to a restaurant, and that's what what we normally do. Look at the menu. Is there grass-fed steak available? Is there this? That's it. You go to a restaurant and the first thing I will tell them, please don't waste your bread. We won't won't eat it. Mm. So don't even bring it to the table. And they always... Oftentimes, most restaurants are willing to give you a substitute for something you don't want. Okay. You can have a burger without a bun, you know. So <laughs> all of those are. So no, you can. I um, I also have a my cooking is not only um, a therapy for me, but it's a hobby. It's what I love to do. I've always liked it, even as a kid. Uh, I used to decorate platters with fruits and vegetables for my family, uh, but. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can eat healthy pretty much in any situation. All you have to do is know and be educated about it, which is what I love to do. I love to teach people because I can tell you, all right, that's what you're going to eat for like four months. Then I'm leaving or, you know, we're not going to be together forever. And then you forget, why did you say I shouldn't eat this? But the key is I take a lot more time teaching my clients why and how it affects their body if they didn't or if they did. And then they know that they have their own roadmap so they don't ever get lost. Right. They can always refer to that. So that's that. That's the important thing. I love that. You make it very realistic for busy people to incorporate Mm -hmm. this into their life. And it's a lot of just being aware of where you're going out to eat. It's Mm -hmm. about being conscious of making choices, making the choices. Yep. You make at the end of the day, what you put in your mouth is completely up to you and no one can force you to eat anything. Right. (laughs) And some people like, including myself, we think, okay, it's going to be difficult to incorporate these changes, which is true at the beginning. Right. Because yeah. we're putting more. How much effort do we really have to place right now in our current routine on what we eat? Right. Not much because it's become automatic, just like we walk yeah. automatically, we breathe automatically, but it quickly becomes a force of habit. And right. OK, so let's say I eliminate grains from because I I just full transparency. I eat a lot of bread. I eat a lot of pasta. Most people do. Food. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but what would you suspect that mm-hmm. how, how would you suspect I would feel differently After a bit of time, how much time would it take to feel differently? And what differences might I notice? For grains within a week or two. One one or two weeks. One or two weeks. For most people is their digestive system is a lot better. You you know, everyone's bloated these days. Everyone. Mm. So that is the number one thing. And number two is less aches and pains in general. People with arthritis, um you know, achy joints and stuff within a week, they feel that already. It's very, very quick. And for some cases, and one of the most phenomenal results I will share with you is with uh, neurological conditions such as Parkinson's or MS. 
That is so phenomenal. It is amazing to me, even to this day, every single time I work with someone with Parkinson's, two weeks later, their symptoms are so much less and so much alleviated. It's incredible. Wow. But the opposite is true too. So grains are actually really affect the brain more than anything else. Interesting. So, you know, brain fog, everyone talks about, you know, yes. that three in the afternoon, kind of needing a cup of coffee and all of that kind of stuff. That is another thing people don't experience is that, oh, my, my brain clarity, my gosh, my brain works better. Even for people who don't have neurological conditions. Um, that's just a few things I can say um, that people experience immediately. Just feeling better without the bloat, you know, and they lose weight if they need to, <laughs> you know, yeah. which gonna, unfortunately, make... unfortunately, a lot of people these days, you know, over 50% of our population are even either obese or overweight, sadly. Yeah. And that has a lot of comorbidities, including cancer. So, you know, that's one one thing that one major thing that most people experience within a week or two, they start losing weight. That's amazing. And mm -hmm. I, I, I was that I, I was fat practically my entire life up until mm -hmm. I was 18 years old. And I had someone who came into my life when I was 21, who said, you've got to make some changes. Right. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just because they were looking out for my future health. I, my obesity was affecting how I felt about myself, how of I interacted course. with others. And they said, you need to make a change. And mm -hmm. I did within six months, I lost 60 pounds. And oh, I felt wow. Like and that was while still eating grains, that was still right. eating all that's still a lot of changes. I mean, yeah, you probably made a lot of changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. And that's just so, one thing, right? Exactly. And I'm always looking for different strategies to become even sharper because mm -hmm. I understand what that brain fog is. And I'm, I'm really good at working through the mm -hmm. brain fog. What, yeah. would, what would it look like to eliminate it. the brain fog? Altogether? See, that's the thing. Most people are, get, are so used to certain symptoms that they, are, they learn to live with them. And then when you take that away and they're like, oh, that's how life should be. Mm. Like, that's how I should feel. And but they're gotten used to the alternative so much that, oh, waking up with aches and pains is normal, you know, or getting bloated after every time I eat is totally normal. Like, no, yeah. that's not. <laughs> no, <laughs> none of that is normal, you know. So, yeah, it's just getting used to certain symptoms. and not knowing what the alternative is until you eliminate it. And then you realize, huh, this is how I'm really supposed to feel. Yes. Yeah. Just because you caught me off guard with grains, I didn't expect you to say that. Now, curiosity, is there anything else, even just one other thing without going too deep into it, maybe that we can eliminate in order to see a big result, very similar to grains? Yes. Another very controversial topic, all animal-based dairy. Animal-based dairy, yeah, like whole milk, whole milk, yogurt, cheese, anything, non-fat milk. Yep. So here's the deal: cow's milk for calves, human milk for babies until weaning age. It's that simple. We don't consume our own mother's milk after age two normally because that's when we're supposed to be weaned off yeah. of mother's milk. It serves a purpose. It has human growth hormones for humans. It has bovine growth hormones for cows. It has mice growth hormones for mice and so on and so forth. It's very species specific. So do you ever see a cow breastfeeding of an elephant or, <laughs> or an adult cow breastfeeding of an adult cow? You don't no. see that. Not natural. For us, it's something, again, we became lazy with our food. Instead of eating the cow, we started milking the cow. Mm. And so that's another place where I'm controversial because how often do you hear, when do I get my calcium? You actually don't get your calcium from milk. You actually leach your bones out of calcium because you're having dairy. And there's a long conversation about that, but it actually makes your bones look like Swiss cheese. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> even so, yogurt like you know you go get the oikos or the chobani any yeah oh, any any of that any of that it's i have a joke actually uh, it's not very very funny but it's a truthful joke i say to a lot of my clients your non-fat chobani yogurt is making you fat Whoa. and it does it does it has nothing to do with its fat so yeah that's another thing so there's those are two things and if you 
eliminated those, I always say three categories of foods that you, if you eliminated all of those, I guarantee you, you will feel 75% better. Wow. That's processed sugar in any shape or form or color, white sugar, brown sugar, sugar in a raw, organic, all of that processed sugar. I'm not talking about fruits. I'm not talking about honey or maple syrup or any of that. Processed sugar, all animal-based dairy, anything that comes from another animal's milk, whether it be milk, yogurt, cottage cheese, whatever, and all grains, gluten or non-gluten, especially non-gluten. Wow. Eliminate those, I guarantee it, and then come talk to me (laughs) because that's just the first step. (laughs) Now you're starting to feel, "Uh uh-huh, yes. This is how I should feel, right? And then then we pinpoint and we really get into the details of what you should eat for you optimally. So this is fantastic. I'm mm-hmm. learning so much. Thank you so much. Like I, I wish I had forever to talk with you because I could. I know I can talk about this forever. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so we, we've talked about elimination. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've talked about even myths that may be in your medicine cabinet with the Advil and other mm-hmm. capsules you might be taking with dyes, which I also didn't know. Let's talk about, is there something that you eat on a daily basis or as close to a daily basis that you wouldn't remove from your health regimen because of the benefits that it provides you? Let's talk about addition. What can we add to what we're eating in order to get a great boost of health? That's a great question too. Oh, so many good things. So I always try to say uh, vegetables and fruits, but I say vegetables first and fruits because they're most important. Okay. Are your powerhouses of all the nutrients and all the micronutrients and all the um, antioxidants and things that you need to help your body fight disease and stay healthy. So your carbohydrates should come from all plants vegetables and fruits. That's number one thing. So on a daily basis, you should have, are you ready for this? At least six types of vegetables more than once a day. And I'm not saying six steps at once. I'm saying in a day, you should have at least six steps of vegetables. At least two of your meals should have a good boatload of vegetables on there. That's your carbohydrates. You should have at least one serving of fruit every single day. Just one serving of fruit. Oh, at least one serving of fruit. So I put more emphasis on vegetables than I put on fruit. Not to say fruits are bad, but vegetables provide you a lot more. And you have to eat, you eat that with almost every meal. So that's the number one thing. But I'm, I'm not of a plant-based diet, um, you know, philosophy. Don't take me wrong. We are not supposed to be vegan. We're not supposed to be vegetarian. That's not beneficial. So a good, healthy protein all the time. That varies from individual to individual, but natural, good, healthy, grass-fed, non-hormone treated, all of that protein. So that's pretty much much like the cornerstone of everything, pretty much the basic, right? But I would say every single day, if, if I happen to be, and it happens to me sometimes, you know, I might be on a, a 12 hour, you know, I, I was stuck actually last year. I was coming back from California to East Coast. It's already long. Flight got canceled all over New York City. And I was in the airport for 12 hours and plus the however many hours that I was supposed to be on a plane. And I had only packed so much amount of food and vegetables that wouldn't go bad because I thought, well, it's a trip, you know, it's a, I had one connection. But I hadn't accounted for the whole airport shut down. And mind you, nothing was really available because it was so crowded. All their you know, airlines had canceled. So I ended up, okay, my backup foods were like nuts and some other like non-vegetable stuff. I ran out of all of my things. And that happens sometimes. But if a day like that happens, I have to like recoup from that personally because I'm so used to eating my vegetables. So on a daily basis, if you're not getting vegetables, variety of vegetables that's already not not good so one of the first things you want to have variety of vegetables on a daily basis now broccoli is good but um not all vegetables are created equal so have variety can you give us an idea of a way that you 
because I'm all about efficiency and it can be difficult mm-hmm. at times to plan our life around these meals. So mm-hmm. what are some easy ways to get a variety of vegetables? How do you incorporate like, and, and specifically maybe even which vegetables will you, will you pick? Absolutely. Up? That's a great question. You, you hit it because I love cooking. So <laughs> every Sunday I prep my food and I'm very efficient now. So it takes me less than two hours to pretty much prep all of our lunches and dinners for the week. Wow. For two people. So here's the deal. I pick four, five, six vegetables that I like and mix and match them every week. Take this Brussels sprouts, leeks, mushrooms, peppers, and asparagus. Okay. Mm. I chop all of these, season them, and I bake them and or air fry them or however way, broil them, grill them. Anyway, summer's a lot grilling. But pretty much I make a lot of this in, ahead of time. So mm-hmm. now I have all that variety. So I just have to scoop that, add my protein, and I'm all set. <laughs> wow. I don't have to cook every day. I don't have time to cook every day, right? Yeah. So nobody does. I mean, most people don't. I mean, if you're retired and if you have nothing to do and you want to cook every single day fresh, that's great. But 95% of the people don't. So I get it. But take two hours on a weekend to prep and then you're set. Another thing is even with salads, if you get pre-washed mixed green if you're so busy, organic pre-washed mixed green, get cherry tomatoes. I even like slice my cucumbers and radishes and stuff ahead of time in containers and just throw them all together. So there are ways to do that. And I teach all of that. Wow. I teach all of that to my clients so that you are set for success because we don't want to get to like Tuesday and like, oh, what am I going to eat for dinner? Now I have to chop vegetables and I have to we don't have time for that. And then what happens at that point? You're like, oh, well, well just let's order a pizza, right? Yes. Exactly. But if you if you are prepared, then you don't have to. You just heat it up, <laughs> right? So that's one example. You might not br- like Brussels sprouts, which is fine. Some people don't. There are Brussels sprouts lovers and there are Brussels sprouts haters in this world. There's nothing in between. That's my experience. <laughs> Just one example. I love Brussels. You pick broccoli, you pick cauliflower, you pick whatever vegetables you are. There are so many vegetables out there. Yes. Until they get my whole list and like, what is that? Oh, let's try <laughs> that together. So that's just a simple way, you know, and anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. I'm so inspired by this conversation. <laughs> I love Thank this. You. So, you. so you mentioned when you work with me and the way that I help my clients. So, so let's talk about that. You've already mentioned your blueprint that you're mm-hmm. offering to people who listen to this podcast for nothing. They Absolutely. literally go to the link in the description and they'll enter their email and you send them a seven day blueprint. Yep. You've already mentioned lightly what that looks like, but what will people take away from this, this blueprint you're providing for seven days? So this is something I give to every pain client before they even start. And it's just getting them started. So I think that every single human being out there should have this. And that's why I provide it for free because it's part of a paid program. But if the more people I can touch, the more people I can at least get started with removing toxins out of their bodies, the happier I am. Because my mission in life is my vision is to create a culture of health where everyone's health is everyone's priority. And health is not a privilege. It's a right. Everyone has the right to health. So this seven-day blueprint technically will walk you through stages of places of your house one day at a time, and it gives you a list of things to get rid of. It Mm. comes from your refrigerator to your pantry to your laundry room to your medicine cabinet to uh, your bathrooms, your cleaning supplies, all of that. And then it gives you a time to go shop. The last days are like, oh, here are some resources. Now that you've gotten rid of all of these things, what are you going to (laughs) do? How are you going to clean your house, right? So all of that is then also there's a couple of things provided. So in seven days, and I give them seven days because um, it might be overwhelming for a lot of people. If I said, take a day, just go through all of your house and do this. It's a lot. Yeah. And it gives you step by step. We start with food and we go through other rooms in the house. And when we finish, hopefully you've eliminated about 95% of all the toxins that affect your health, whether it be ingesting them, inhaling them as a medicine or supplement or putting them on your skin or do your laundry. All of those things affect your health. 
So it's that's pretty much the gist of it. And that's how I start all of my clients, because that's a good way to start. Now that we've cleaned up everything, we're going to replace it with good things. And remember, Mm -hmm. if something is in the house, um, if it's eating, you might be tempted to go eat it. Right. But if it's not there, you won't. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So if you had to choose between a pretzel because it's quick or you know, uh, chopped up vegetables, for example, or something healthier. Um, if you don't have the pretzel, you're going to eat the vegetables, right? <laughs> exactly. Just like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm assuming just like when I eliminated soda from my life, once, mm-hmm. once you do it and you feel better and you see the results, yeah. even when you're around the thing that you, you quote unquote might want, you don't want it anymore because you've made it a habit and you've seen the results yeah. not consuming that. Thing. Right. Right. And consistency in, is the thing. It has to become a lifestyle. I teach it as a lifestyle. I always tell people, if you're here to go lose weight for a wedding in three months, I'm not your person. Mm. I mm-hmm. won't take that client. You need to be committed to make a lifestyle change and adopt it for life. And I give you everything you need to adopt it. And it will teach you how to, it takes time. Yeah. because it was habits and I have methods that I've coined that uh, help people get through, but you really have to make a commitment to yourself first. And yeah. I always say you are the most important person in your life and your health is your most valuable asset. That's simple, but it's hard for people to digest that. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for people to implement it, but yes. you really are the most important person in your life because no matter who you love, and who you do anything in your life for, if you are not here tomorrow, it doesn't matter. Yes. So you are the most important person in your life. 100%. And for the people who say, I already know that I want to work with you. I love everything you're sharing. I'm going to implement this. I'm going to grab the blueprint. But they also notice that you have your eat to be fit course. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an idea of what people will take away when they go through your actual full-blown course. Absolutely. So I told you I'm inefficient in that, that I'm an only person when it comes to customized, you know, um, programs. I created the Eat to Be Fit course. It's a 24-week course and I teach in depth everything for the first 12 weeks about food, the good and the bad and the ugly. And I give you all the resources and tools you need about food. The second 12 weeks is all about non-food things such as your sleep, your hormones, your stress level, all the other things about health that affects you. So in six months, you will basically have a comprehensive course that teaches you everything about nutrition and lifestyle to take care of you, take control of your health. It, the level, uh, the basic level, the self face is not customized, but you still get me as a coach twice a month. If you have questions, if you have any troubles, you also have to do homework because I'm an academician. I make you do homework. So you have to do your homework. You have to every week finish and measure and evaluate your progress. That's the thing. We meet twice a month. That's self-paced for people who just want to do it on their own. And they can do that. And they have me twice a month. And um, they also have an exercise app for my business partner that they can do anywhere in the world. Um, then for those people who actually want all of that, but they also want their own customized program completely with me as a coach, you get me plus that you meet with me and I design your program based on exactly who you are and what you try to rest, what your goals, uh, heaven forbid, you may have a condition, a health concern. And that is the basically, um, level up with that. And, um, the biggest thing about the eat to be fit is eat to be fit, like really use food to be fit as far as evolutionary fit, right? Mm -hmm. Also fitness is great, but you know, I'm talking about fit, healthy, to live a long, healthy life without pain. Yeah. And the only way for me to be able to provide this education to a lot of people without me being the limiting factor is to offer it as a course. Uh, the course is very comprehensive. Uh, it's You will not find it anywhere else in the world because I've created it. The lectures are by myself. You'll see my face mm-hmm. um, teaching you and you will see me twice a month. That's uh, great. If you're in that self-paced, yeah. 
Fantastic. And everyone, there are links in the description for both the seven day blueprint as well as the eat to be fit course. Go check it out. The links down there, Dr. Lale, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. We got to have you back on the show in the future because we scraped the surface here. So we'll make that happen, but thank you for your time and for your Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Whether you are in a situation in your life or you know someone in a situation where they are looking to defeat or overcome an illness or disease, or you know someone who wants to prevent it from happening in general or entirely, then this conversation has been for you. I hope you took something away from this conversation with Dr. Lale Talebian. Be sure to go to the links in the description to check out her seven-day blueprint as well as the Eat to Be Fit course, which will bring you through everything we talked about and so much more in its entirety so that you can feel better, look better and live longer. If you took away even just one thing from this conversation with Dr. Lale, all that we ask is you share this show with just one other person who could use it as well. Thank you for being the best part of the Be Better team. Thank you for watching. And until we talk again next time, continue to be better.